Good morning. Good Happy morning. Happy Saturday. Oh, that you're talking to me. <laughs> that good you're morning talking to them. you. Hi, good morning. Hey, what's up? All right. <laughs> Thanks. Good to see you guys. Uh, obviously, this is Ronnie, and we came up with a new name for you the other day. We did? No, that's not, it's not new. The artist formerly known as Jen. That's the one... <laughs> The one word name, she's achieved it. So uh, we're going to talk today, guys, about some of the stuff that's really worked well for us over our, uh, hey, good morning, Bubba, what's up, man? Um, hey, Jen, what's up? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit Just here saying, saying hi to everybody. Hi to everyone. Hey, hey guys. Um, we're going to talk about some of the stuff that works for us. Hey, Jenny. Uh, things that work for us and that's made, I, I think it's made our relationship work well, uh, besides the fact that my wife is super cool. Like she's the reason it's so That's awesome. Cool. But uh, good night in Malaysia. But I'm definitely sticking around for you guys. Hi, Hannah. How oh, are wow. you? Wow. Hi. Malaysia. Hi, Deanna. Good morning. That's awesome. Karen Wimpy. Who's do you know? Karen Wimpy. Mom! Hi. Man. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Just so, a minute ago, he said, "You look like your mom." <laughs> she turned the camera on. I was like, "You look like your mom." Uh, hey. Anyway, hey, Jocelyn. Hey, Josh. What's up? So again, we're going to talk some of, about some of the stuff that's really worked well for us over how long we've been together. Since 16, 2004, 16, 16 years. years. Yeah, I know that's hard to believe, but Oof. it's been amazing. So uh, we're going to talk about what's worked for us. We'll talk about some of the things that obviously don't, but uh, we're going to talk about really what I believe the keys are to creating really good relationships. Whether you're in business, whether it's marriage, whether it's just relationship with your family, your friends. I think relationships are ultimately the key to life, and so we're going to discuss that. And uh, as you guys get stuff, feel free. Are you going to do questions on there? Yeah. Last week, I don't know if, if all of you were here with us last week, but we had uh, people asking questions here on the live stream. But also, if you feel like you want to ask an anonymous question without it being exposed to the world, you can <laughs> you can either email us at info at dosteam.com or uh, right here on Messenger make it easy yeah. if you want. I'm looking over to the side, but the camera's out here. What? <laughs> anyway. I'm talking to you off to the side. It. That's, a, Hello. that's the key. You think you're looking at, that's, that's, that's the yeah, appearance. You think you're looking at one thing, but you see something. I know, and I'm looking different. down to make sure I'm not going to miss anybody's. Um, Can I have a sip? Sure. <laughs> it's out of the big, Jen got me this big R mug. It's nice. It's big R. That's what she calls me around the house, big R. Big so, uh, Daddy yes, you can have a sip. Any Daddy Rabbit. <laughs> my my, my stepmom calls my dad Daddy Rabbit. It's funny. Anyway, um, what you what are we doing? You ready to roll? Or are you gonna? Yeah, good morning. love y'all. I know. Hey, Fran. Uh, hey, Dr. Holbert, Katie. What's hello. up? That's what Kevin calls you Daddy Rabbit. Daddy too. Rabbit. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Hi, Kevin. Okay. Hi, Trisha. So, Hi, all right, Sophie. let's do it. We, we can say hey all morning. We, I know. We've got things to do. We've got our parenting to do. Um, parenting. Yes, we do. <laughs> and kudos to you if you know what that means, parenting. 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 Yes. Um, all right, you ready to um, do it? Yeah. We just, we are constantly in conversation about what makes us work and why it's important. And we feel like it's, it's important for the people that we love to know this also not that we have it all figured out, you know. We uh, like to we tend to think that we do, but we feel like we one thing that we have done really well is us. And we're proud of that. And we wanted to talk about it and have a conversation and talk to each other, you guys, and you know, just let us in on anything that you want to know and not let's anything go. you want to know. Not anything, but cuz obviously there's a lot of pressing questions. Anyway. Yeah. Um so from with that, you know, working with as many people as I get to work with, one of the things that's really awesome is seeing people succeed in their business. I love that. I am all about results and performance and making sure that the outcome in, in business works. It's one of my old sayings, though, is that if you win in the marketplace but you fail at home, that's still a failure. It doesn't make you a failure. Anytime you screw up, mess up, doesn't make you a failure. Uh, failure is not an identity. It's just something that we walk through. And so... A lot of times we have to be willing to fail forward. When we mess up, we, we screw it up, we learn from it, we keep pressing forward. Some people don't want to do that. What they do is they'll take a failure, whether it was at an early age, whether it was uh, just getting started, or, or at some point, maybe even very recently, they take a failure and they use it to identify themselves. And in some ways, that then gives them permission to not keep pushing or not keep pressing towards what they would say 
was their next level. And so when Jen and I got married, um, Jen knew when we first met, she knew that I was about pushing it. I, I work for myself. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, we say that I'm psychologically unemployable, which is very true. I get up very early. I do my own thing. I march to the beat of my own drum. That's how I roll. And she supports that. And she's very much that same way in, in what she does. And so um, with that, she knew. And so we've held each other accountable to a next level for us. And we've never allowed ourselves to really give up on that goal uh, that we've had to reach a next level. We've moved to a lot of places. We live in Scottsdale, Arizona now. That is not where we grew up. We both grew up in the South. Uh, I came to Scottsdale probably about 20 years ago for the first time and just absolutely loved it. And she knew that that was a goal, something that I wanted to do. And we started coming out here. I was doing some trainings for American Express and I started looking around again and brought her out with me. And we looked around and she was like, yeah, we should do that. And so we moved out here and it's been, what, six, almost seven months and we love it. It's, it's starting to be warm. It's 90 degrees here now. So um, it's hot, but the girls are loving the pool. And so we've always pushed for whatever we wanted to do with our life. I think one of the biggest things for us is that with our daughters who Addison's 10, Kennedy's six, we made the decision that we were going to set an example for them uh, because we know, it's the old saying, more is caught than is taught. We wanted to set an example for our kids that if you want something, you set the goal, you work your butt off, you go for it. That's the deal. And it doesn't matter what that is. The, the point of it is, is I'm not trying to manipulate my children. She does, she's the same. I'm not trying to manipulate our girls to be one particular thing. I'm not trying to tell them what to think. We're trying to show them how to think. And that's the, that's the culture in our home is that, that you know, you've got to think for yourself. You have to ask questions. And, you know, there's a, I just, uh, it was a, a quote by Cromwell that I just read. And it said that if you stop getting better, you stop being good. And that's such a powerful quote. And so what we're always trying to do is to be better. Our, our daughters see us well now because we're, you know, sheltered in place. They see us exercise at home. They see us up early. They see us having conversations like this. They see us reading. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge reader. I read all the time. But we're just setting an example. We don't want our kids to be something. It's not that we're trying to get them to be something. My daughter Addison goes through this thing where she wants to be a baker. She wants to have her own bake shop. The other time, I think she wants to be a fashion designer. She wants all these different things. At one point, it was like, maybe I'll be an astronaut. And then she said, no, she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to leave, leave, leave us behind. That's what she said. But we're just trying to set that example. And so for each other, we're creating space always on how to keep pushing towards whatever is next. And I think that, and, and I would just, in my humble yet accurate opinion, which very is very humble, very, very very humble. humble of you. but in my opinion, I think if you stop pushing yourself, you stop bringing something really great to the marriage, to the relationship. You have to push yourself. I've got to push myself. I feel better when I push myself. She feels better when she pushes herself, when we're learning new things and talking about new things. If we stop doing that, I'm actually ripping the relationship off. And so one of the things that we've talked about many times is when we're in conversation together, there's three people sitting at the table. If we're sitting here. There's me, there's Jen, and there's the marriage. And so there's three of us. And so we're always in consideration of the marriage. And so the question would be is how do you bring the best part of you to the marriage so that the marriage works? Just because it's a sheet of paper and you say, well, we're married, that doesn't mean it's going to work. People get divorced at 10 years. People get divorced at 20 years. People get divorced at 30 years. And it happens, right? And so just because you have a sheet of paper doesn't mean the relationship is working. And that doesn't mean that you have to be spot on 100% given everything you have every single moment because that's one of the beauties of relationship. If she's having a rough day, I'm, I'm stronger. If, if I'm having a rough day, she's stronger. And together we carry this load of, of getting things done. And it's, that's what I think makes it work. And yeah. so that's been our, our thing for, for so long. And, and uh, that's really kind of the context that we want to discuss. So. Okay, well, we're done. <laughs> okay, take care. Good luck. I'm going to go have some okay. coffee and a scrumpet. No. Crumpet. Scone, Sorry. crumpet, crumpet, scrumpet. Crumpets. It's from Dumb and Dumber. I know. Tea and crumpets. Tea and it's crumpets. our favorite movie, scrumpet. by the way. You guys, yeah, anyway. What you want to, what you, anything you want to? Uh, no, I mean, after all of that, um, that one thing that you said, I also wanted to make a point was, you know, not just the signing of the paper, but when you say your vows, you don't say, 
a vow to become roommates eventually. And that's one thing I feel like we've been very intentional is to not let that ever happen. And it's a day-to-day -day work. Like last week, you talked last week about doing the work instead of just a work. Like a work is doing things around the house, cooking dinner for you or whatever. But I'm do am I doing the work to make our marriage stronger, not just the inner everyday inner workings of like what goes on and the, the monotony of what could be in a marriage or whatever. I, we're doing the work to make it work every day and making it a new day yeah. each time. So the difference here, so this is my a teaching point. I don't want this to be like so teaching because I do that all the time. I, I talk so much about that, but I think this stuff is, is so important. And so the first thing is if you were to look at two things, like if you look at your day-to-day -day and you go to work and you do your tasks, so to speak, that's what we call A work or I call A work. A work is, is uh, straightening up your office. A work is cleaning up after your kids. A work is um, mowing the lawn or whatever. Uh, cleaning out the pool, A work, right? A work can be what you do when you go to work. And the work is the place where you're doing this with one another, you're having conversations. But the main thing is, is that you're turning your, your, your focus onto yourself. And when you turn your focus onto yourself, you develop more and more of what I call self-awareness. And so there's this, this old quote that says, awareness is the beginning of change. But self-awareness is the beginning of progress. Mm -hmm. And so everything that we're doing is about progress. We hope. We hope we're making progress. Not perfectly. It's not like every day you get up and you're like, yeah, we made great strides towards our goals. There's days you wake up and you get blindsided by mm -hmm. COVID-19. <laughs> I don't know if y'all watched the Kenneth Copeland remix. But oh my anyway, uh, I had to do it. I had to do it. I had to put it in there. But you get blindsided by like COVID-19 and, you know, it's like, what? It is. And, and you have to shelter in place for as long as some people have. Nobody could have expected that. So like you've got this plan of progress and you're moving forward and then all of a sudden hits you from left field. You have a family member that gets sick. You have a friend that gets sick. You have one of your children, you know, aren't feeling well. Something goes on with your business, a client, you're, you're working to help them out. Um, you know, our focus a lot of times is on progress, you know, and looking at what we think we want to do, but you don't make progress every single day. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's maybe bigger strides. Right, you get you a contract, you get a promotion, you something goes on, you book a trip, you you're like, all right, we're making progress, um, but it doesn't always feel like that. And there's one of the things that that I've discussed in a lot of my trainings is that there's a point where you get to a plateau, and if you don't ever learn to master the plateau, you don't ever actually really learn to master your life. Mm -hmm. And because life is a lot of plateaus, there's ups and downs, but a lot of times on a plateau, you can't see a lot of change happening. The only thing you may see changing is you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you're like, wow, I've got one more wrinkle than I had before, right? And you go, oh, I'm getting older. But that, that doesn't always, as far as big change, you don't see it a lot. Like, there's a, we moved like seven months ago. That was a big change. But there's years before that where it's like, it doesn't seem like lots of things are changing so drastically. And you've got to be okay with that. And so the progress part of it, you have to know. But... Um, and, and there's plateaus to it, but during the plateau, this is where it's such a great time to focus on the work, which is where you turn your focus inside and you ask yourself, what am I doing today to be better? What am I doing today to expand my capacity as a leader in my home? What am I doing today to make me better so that I can answer questions that my children may ask? Um, what am I doing now to, to help me in my physical health to be better? What am I doing today with what I, I'm learning so that I can stay more motivated, pushing towards whatever next is going to be? Because if you give yourself permission to stop and you don't develop more and more self-awareness, knowing what your strengths are, knowing what your weaknesses are, listing those things out, talking about them mm -hmm. and saying, hey, here's how I support you with that. Here's how I need support with this. If you stop having those kind of conversations, the marriage, the relationship, anything can start to get stag stagnant. Friendships can start to become very stagnant. And one of the things that this is, I heard someone else say this, so it's not just my belief, and I'm done, and I want you to talk for a minute if you'd be willing, is that you, are, you in time will outgrow friends. 
And what I mean by that, that might sound so bad. I love all my friends. I love everybody that I've ever met and, and had the privilege of knowing them and their lives crossing paths with our lives and all of that. But if you're continually sharpening the blade, this is Ronnie's personal thing and, and she'll tell you. I get bored very easy in conversation. That's it. I shouldn't have said that, but I'm saying it. When I sit around and if there's no conversation and it's not stimulating to me, I have a hard time being present and I have a hard time with small talk. And the reason that I'm telling you that is because I, time is so valuable to me. When you've seen or had people leave your life, my, my mentor, Mr. Clemmer, passed away. My stepfather, John, passed away. Recently, a very good friend of mine, Matthew, passed away. Years ago, a friend of mine, Mark, passed away very suddenly. Young, young people. And, if, and when you've had those things happen, you start realizing, you know what? I don't have a whole lot of time to waste. And so it's not that I'm chasing somewhere else to be. It's not that I have to think there's always somewhere else to be. It's just that I know that I'm probably going to arrive somewhere else called tomorrow. And if I haven't sharpened the blade and made myself a little better, when I get to tomorrow, I may not be as prepared as I need to be and I could miss out on an opportunity that can make a difference for my family. It can make a difference for her. It can make a difference for my children. It can make a difference for how we grow as a family together in the future. And so I don't do a lot of like small talk. I love to laugh and sit around and play, but as for just giving you a glimpse into how my mind operates is that that's me. I just don't enjoy sitting around and talking about, I don't talk about the past. I just don't. Um, we've been together 16 years. We don't focus a lot on that. We laugh a little bit about things that have gone on before, but we really enjoy talking about the future and what we want to do. And so the work is about preparing yourself for the future. And we, that's one of the things that we are aware of. Now, somebody might say this and I'm done and I do want you to say something. Somebody may go, well, Ronnie, my spouse isn't really about that. They don't, whatever. So here's the answer. You don't worry about what your spouse is doing. Like, you can't change your spouse. What you have to work on first and foremost is you. If you will work on you, it creates space for your spouse to step in and, and grow as well. When she pushes herself with the intensity that she does working out and exercising, which she does and has and always has, when she's pushing herself that way, if I see her and I'm watching her, I'm like, man, I got to step up my game. I, I just do. I can't be around that and, and sit around and be like taking it so easy and seeing her push herself. It's the same way with me. I read. I do all this stuff. She's. That's a nice. That's a nice <laughs> bicep. That's a nice <laughs> bicep. Did you see that? You see that? What's happening? Through the red shirt. Yeah, through your shirt. Um, but. You know, it creates space, guys. And so I think one of the biggest things for a really cool relationship, a perfect relationship like we have. You didn't think that was, that was a funny joke. She doesn't even laugh at my jokes right. anymore. That's one thing. That's why I stopped being funny. That's why I'm so serious all the time. Right. It's because she doesn't even was, laugh at my right jokes. When you said that I was reading a question. We should have a fight. <laughs> we should just have a fight right here on the thing and see who, who you guys think would win if Jen and I had a fight. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> Katie. I see Come you. On. Katie knows. <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, it's like, and, and speaking of friends, like Katie yeah. and Russ, great friends of ours in uh, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, both chiropractors, uh, both just phenomenal people. They work on themselves. Beautiful family. They have their businesses. They get after it. And, you know, that's, these are the kind of people that we like to spend time with because it's like, there are people that are responsible. We are responsible for. And so, to the point... Uh, I think if you create space for someone else to step up their game, if they're spending time with you, uh, you, you help to make them better when they choose to, you create space. When I used to spend time and travel with my mentor, Mr. Clemmer, you could be around him, and, and just because of his intensity and love of people, that's what I picked up on more than the, the modules and the insights that he shared with me. It's like you pick up on that, right? And so when you're around people, that's the same. More is caught than taught. And so... Um, Anyway, where are, you, where are you at? What you got? Um, everybody's saying Jen, by the way. <laughs> we knew this. Okay. No, well, you know what, guys? <laughs> you, know, we're, you know what? We're done. <laughs> no, we're so done. You know, guys, I work really hard to make this thing happen, and now you're saying that she could take me. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. We're gonna, maybe we're going to do that next time. We're going to just have a, just like a 30-second wrestling match. <laughs> just 30 seconds, and we're you taking wagers. <laughs> Taking wagers. 
put money on Jen, that's fine. I think yep. you're going to be, sorry, Ronnie, no yeah, votes for you. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> that's right. No, he's back. <laughs> votes. Yeah, that's right. Your mom's got you. Yeah, no, nothing for Ronnie. Beast mode. I don't know who that was, but okay. Uh, it questions. You you wanted to ask, you, you asked something about the takeaway. Like, what's the one thing yeah, that you so, said earlier? Uh, yeah, I, wanted, I did, I did want to ask you. Um, we've, you've already given us so much um, to chew on already, but if somebody had to go now, like they had to stop watching, they have, you know, kids and other things to do. What is one thing as far as uh, what we're talking about? And and it could just not be for marriage relationships in general. What would be like a one takeaway that you would want people to know? Okay. And then we're going to answer these. From, yeah. And then cool we have, questions. we do have some really cool One takeaway. If somebody so. were to get the, the sound bite of, of what I'm about and what I want, what's so funny? <laughs> but can't. Can't, can I put five dollars down for every time Ronnie says Jen can talk? I just laughed. <laughs> Sorry. You shut your mouth, Ken. Kent. 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 I didn't get it right. Kent. Kent Rep Replogle. Uh, uh, the thing, the main takeaway is, yeah. if I were to give someone a soundbite of what what we're about and what my focus is, is that all of it starts with your mind. Everything starts with your mind. If you've created a story that because of how you grew up, maybe your family, what you saw, maybe what you had or didn't have, how much education you had, your family, your surroundings, all of that stuff, that, that's, that's your story. It's a narrative that's in your mind. And once you decide something in your mind, you will spend the rest of your life trying to make yourself right because you don't want to be disassociated with what you think is your reality. And so if I create a story in my mind, then I go look to find things that will reinforce that narrative or that story. And that's the biggest thing that I think people don't really understand is that we produce results in our life in direct alignment with our, our thoughts. And so it all starts with our thoughts. Now, question, are there natural tendencies for us to think or feel certain ways? Absolutely, right? Neuropathways are set in your mind, but here's an, an analogy. Imagine you have a, a hill with some snow on it and somebody decides to start sledding down that hill. Once someone sleds down the hill, if you have one of those plastic, if you ever have one of those plastic sleds that you jump in and you, you know what I mean? Not, not the like metal trash one. Can, not, trash can lid? <laughs> something like that, right? And, and yeah. so you get on that. Once you've gone down that hill a few times, guess what happens? The path starts to be laid more and more, and you tend to go that direction. That's what the neuropathways in our brain are like. Once you have continually reinforced a thought or given permission to a thought that I could never have that, there is no way I could ever do that. Once you give permission to that thought and you allow it to run, allow it to run, that thought is a picture. You keep letting that picture into your mind. It's going to produce more neuropathways, a, a more um, uh, reinforced neuropathway. And the next thing you know, you have a natural slant. Do you see that move? Vroom, to go, it's wild and crazy in here. <laughs> you have a tendency to go that route, right? And so over time, if you don't immediately confront, confront the whatever, <laughs> what'd you say that? whatever, if you don't confront it, right, and just say, wait a minute, that's that narrative. I don't, that's not the narrative that I really want. I mean, continuing to run that narrative, it feels familiar, but the, the thought that I have in my mind is really not serving me. I can break out of where I am financially. I could change where I live, I could change my surroundings, I could change, I could paint the walls in my house. I could start changing what I see more and more and keep pushing it a little bit and new neuropathways get, are, are actually start to be developed. It's called refiring and rewiring. I heard that from a guy who was a chiropractor talking about that. When you hold a new picture in your mind, you fire that picture and the chemicals that come from that, those chemicals start to change the neuropathways in your brain. And once those neuropathways start to be changed, it's like sledding down that hill. You're starting to create a new path down that hill. And renewing your mind, as the analogy that, that I heard, was where you decide to reset it, is where you allow some new snow to fall. Mm -hmm. And a new book is like a new snowfall, right? Listening to a podcast, Ronnie Doss podcast on iTunes. Emerge. Emerge podcast. It's just put Ronnie Doss. 
when you do that, right, what happens is you start to lay a new path. And the next thing you know, you're moving down a certain hill faster and faster. I, Kent, I'm getting ready to say, Jen, you can talk, and I need you to have this, and we're going to talk about the question. Um, I am doing what I'm doing only because I, I met someone who I've, I believe gave me permission to go for it that someone really gave me permission to go for it. And I've had some incredible mentors. The guy that, that married us, uh, Dale Bronner in Atlanta, huge ministry, I mean, all over the world, 10,000 people on Sunday. I, I, you know, it's huge. He married us, and I learned a lot from him. And then from him, I, I met my mentor, Mr. Klimmer. He, I saw what he did. I saw training worlds. I saw in-depth seminars and personal development and transformational workshops. I immersed myself in that. I read everything that I could read. And then after spending time with him and then Mr. Clemmer passed away, I just said, all right, I'm gonna go to back to the entrepreneurial world. I'll be in real estate and finance, what I was doing before, or I'm gonna stick with this. And we made the decision that I was just gonna stick with this, had no idea how it was gonna work, but I pushed myself and said, I'm gonna stick with it, hell or high water, no matter how bad this gets, we're gonna stay with it. And we did, and it, it, it has worked. And now I'm where I'm at only because I gave myself permission to do it and stuck with it. Mm -hmm. You can do anything that you decide to do. You may not be a professional athlete if you're 50, but I think if you ask yourself, hey, what, what do I really feel passionate about? What would I like to do? Then you do what you have to do. And I hate to say that word have to until you do what you want to do. But if you give yourself that permission, you move down the hill in a different direction faster and you start to create a new path. And then that's one day how you look up and you're like, wow, this is where we're at. Now I'm actually being compensated to do what I love. Now I'm meeting new people and getting to go to a lot of places. And we've been to a lot of places. We have friends in a lot of cities all over the country, around the world. And, and that's cool. I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. She grew up in a small town in Georgia. And it, it's not that were, we're lucky. I don't think there's any luck to it. I mean, she is beautiful. I mean, she's lucky like that, right? But, the, it's, but it's work, guys. It's work. I've heard all the great fighters. I heard Conor McGregor say it. He, the guy, if you know Conor McGregor, UFC, he said, there's no luck in this. He said, it's absolute passion and discipline, mm -hmm. and that's in anything. And I don't want to make this at all about what Ronnie and Jen are just doing. I just want to let you know that there are principles that you can apply to your life and that you can absolutely transform anything in your life. If you want to move to a new city, move to a new town, move to a new home, you can do it over time. Set the goal and go for it. Don't be so afraid to fail that you disqualify yourself before you even start. Mr. Clemmer used to tell me people don't set goals because when you set a goal and you don't get it fast enough, he said it hurts like hell and people don't want to feel pain. And so they just go ahead and say, well, I just won't set the goal. I'm just not going to do it because I don't want to feel the pain. And so instead of feeling what, what Jordan Peterson called the sharp pain of it, of setting the goal and having to deal with it, instead of that and setting the goal, he said people would rather carry around this dull, nagging ache of hopelessness their whole life and it's just, uh, it's sad. And, and I think that all of us, uh, not deserve, but yes, deserve to see what we can create. And I know a lot of people on here that are commenting, like, um, they're, you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So it all starts in your mind. That's where it starts. It, it doesn't stop there because there's an outward expression of your inward thinking. But if you will give yourself permission and say, this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna set the goal, I'm gonna write it out, and then you put it on a list, and then you start to check little action steps off. Those little steps lead to, it's like the old saying, it's, it's life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You gotta be thinking long-term, but bring that long-term into the present moment and take that one step. And over time, five years, 10 years, you can be in a completely different place, and because you're in a different place, mentally, emotionally, when you look in the mirror, you see something different about yourself. And when you see something different about you, you start to believe so much differently about yourself, then you absolutely become unstoppable. That's where you say, well, you know what? I did that and I achieved it, so now I wanna set that goal. And let me see if I can do that. And then you get after it. And even if you fail and screw it up big time, at least you experienced the feelings of going for something that mattered to you. 
And if we don't do that, it's boring as, I mean, to me, that's why I said I just get bored. It's like it's boring. And I think this is pretty much how I am most of the time. We're going to church on a Saturday. <laughs> Can anybody take that sound bite, that part of the video, and like do something really cool with it? Put it out there in the world? There you go. It's cool. Jeez, man. I don't really know how to follow that, but hey. We're here. Well, let's go. Let's, let's so just what, talk. Tell, I'm going to tell everybody there that. So what with you, what you're hearing, how does this all equate to you? What do you, because you can obviously hear me run my mouth. That's what I do. How do you equate these types of things to your day to day? Well, just for me personally, I have realized and I can so easily just because I'm passionate about exercise and health and nutrition and things like that, I can relate a lot of things to exercise because exercise is simple. It doesn't take a lot of brain power. You figure out what works for you and you do it and then you develop a discipline. And the one thing that I have landed on lately is that I'm not motivated to exercise. I have a discipline for it. So I know that even when I'm not motivated, I'm going to do it anyway. So with that being said, I feel like the mind thing is a much more complex because our minds are so complex, we will never figure out the depths of what our brains can really do. I feel like that's a much more con, con, complex, easy for me to say, much more complex thing to work with. So when I think of my mind and me taking personal responsibility, which is another conversation I would like for us to have, if we have time, um, me taking personal responsibility for my mind and the day-to-day -day is the experiences that I'm creating um, while I'm going through what would be the monotonous tasks throughout the day or you know the mundane or whatever cycle that we can get caught like, up in. Like cleaning up Cheerios after, like, like you know, cleaning I mean, up with kids, right? Straight the, up. The, the little things and the big things, but me being able to take control over my mind and really work on it and develop a discipline as to where my mind goes and where I, where I allow it to go and where I choose for it to go, that's a much harder thing to do. But I have developed a discipline in the day-to-day -day doing that. And w when you practice that on the day-to-day, -day, then it just becomes a way of life. Just how exercise is my way of life. I rarely go without it. It's something that just gives me energy and I know it's gonna help me live longer, hopefully just be healthier, more vibrant, have more energy. That's my way of life, but also a way of life is to develop the discipline of my mind and reading. Well, they, they having, fuel one another. They, they do, they fuel one another, but having the discipline to talk to you when I need to talk to you about something, as far as marriage, because this is the, one of the main concepts. We wanted to keep this as relationship driven, but as far as marriage, I have the discipline to go, you know what, I see something that needs to be fixed, I'm gonna talk to you about it. And I will admit, I've not always been the best at doing that. I just, I have had to work to speak. I've had to work to say what's on my mind, what's on my heart, and that's not easy for me, but I've developed a discipline that I know it's important and that we're holding our marriage at this standard of where that is of utmost importance is our communication. Yeah. And somebody actually asked about, on one of the comments about our communication, but I've developed a discipline in those areas, I feel like where it has helped us move forward together as a couple, as parents, and yeah, communication. I saw that. The style. Okay. Yeah, our so, communication style. So. Okay. So. I hope that wasn't that? like a ramble. No, it's, it, it isn't. I mean, it's so important. Obviously, yeah. it's important to see. A couple of things. Really quick thought on the discipline part. She said mm -hmm. she's not so motivated. She's disciplined. If you struggle with self confidence, which I believe every single person on the on the on the planet struggles with self-confidence at some time. People ask me, Ronnie, do you still get nervous when you go talk? Absolutely. Really, yes, because it still matters. When something matters, you get a little nervous. I see her, like, I still get a little bit of the, the, the butterfly thing happening in my tummy. I mean, I do, which, my tummy, my stomach, <laughs> my abs, this washboard still gets, it matters when things matter and your yeah. life matters to you. So there's gonna be times where you feel nervous, you may feel a bit inadequate, um, self-confidence comes from discipline period 
period. It comes from discipline. People that I have spent time with, and I have spent time with a lot of people, and people tell me, this is one of the gifts of what I do. I wouldn't have imagined it. I go speak on a platform. People say, hey, would you coach me? Would you work with me, my team? I start hearing people of all different levels of influence, income, intelligence, degrees, all of them from any day. Like we could list people that I coach. I hear so many people sharing their thoughts around themselves and their life, and we all struggle with self-confidence on some level. Now, you can't let it control you. you got to go, oh, there it is. That's an emotion, and we can talk a, a bit about that on another, another episode. That a, a feeling is simply a feeling. Once you learn to just recognize, oh, that's that feeling, which is a chemical, I don't have to stay attached to that. And so um, your, your self-confidence comes from discipline. Question. How do you develop discipline? Well, here's, here's how you develop discipline. Take the goal, the big goal that you have, right? Say the big goal is the whole United States, right? Then you take the goal, break it down to a region. You got the Northeast, you got the Southeast, you got the Northwest, you got the Southwest, right? Let's say you put it in those four regions. Take the big goal, break it into some little regions. From there, you break the region down into a state, state down into a city, city down into the little town, town is your house. Ultimately, you take big, break it down to small, bite-sized thing. Mm -hmm. I attack, I attack my own, what I'd say is my own house, which is your own temple. You get after it and you attack that, whatever that is. And that can be reading, that can be your physical health exercise, that can be um, prayer, meditation, that can be your quiet time, it can be together time. If you have a big goal, the problem with a goal being so big is typically there's no accountability. It's like one day, uh, one day I want to be wealthy. One day I want to have a lot of money. That sounds good up there, but what do you do today that's going to lead to that? Because today is the day, right? Today is the day and people procrastinate because they think tomorrow is going to offer them some gift that today did not have. And it's just not true. Especially right now. Some people are like, well, now's a good time to, to focus on some things at home because you, you're being suggested to not leave. Mm -hmm. So you could get some things in alignment here. And so when you have an awareness of something that you could do each day, put it on a sheet of paper and make yourself check it off and say, I can't do this next thing until I get this one thing checked off. And that starts to move you in the direction of progress. And when you start progressing towards something you want, the reward center of your brain, which is what caused all of our ancestors to be explorers and move from one part of the country to the next, is there's a reward center in your brain that when you get closer to it, there's chemicals that are fired off. And, you know, it's the same thing that if somebody's stranded in the desert and they hallucinate and they see an oasis of water, it's like the brain starts kicking chemicals off to move them towards something. And you need that. And so if you break the big goal down to an action step, what can I do right now in this hour that I can move me towards that? That's the discipline part. Everything else is just BS talk of motivation and inspiration and, oh, he'll motivate me. Motivation is garbage. There's going to be days you're going to wake up that you are not going to feel motivated. And if you only do things when you feel motivated, you're probably not going to do them a majority of the time, especially in the beginning. In the beginning especially, but after you've done it for a while, then you see yourself being the kind of person that takes action and moves forward. Then you start believing that and expecting that of yourself, and you set a standard up here of, of moving forward. And so knowing all of that, that standard we hold ourselves to is the place that we communicate from. And so the communication part is, is this. This if. You guys write notes down. You could write this word down because this is a key to a strong relationship. The key is feedback. Not attack, not shaming and guilting and manipulating and all of that garbage that emotionally immature people sometimes do. And I guess we're all emotionally immature because sometimes we can do that. But the value of feedback and authenticity and honesty in the marriage mm -hmm. is absolutely the most important part of any communication style. Because you can make jokes and be silly, and that could be your type of style, but you can still be really honest in that and, you know, and get whatever out that needs to be out, get it out and talk about it. And sometimes 
and you can talk about this now. Sometimes that means you're putting your, your, it's like, hey, this is what I see going on in our relationship and this is what I feel and it sucks and, and I don't like feeling this way because I, for me, I'm gonna own this in vulnerability. If, if we're together and we don't, we're not connected and we're not communicating and there's no intimacy and whatever, over time, I start to tell myself, and, and she said she does the same thing, when I'm so busy, I start to feel rejected. I feel like that I'm not enough. That I go into, well, if, gosh, if I was this and I had this, then maybe she would be more intentional about giving me the attention that I need or whatever. And that's a crappy feeling to have. And so that means there's work I have to do on me. That's what I do. I work on me. But I also am transparent, I guess, or vulnerable enough to say, this is what I feel. And sometimes it sucks because here's what's happening, guys. The moment you put it out there and say, this is what's going on for me, somebody can absolutely reject you. And they can look at you like, why would you even think that? That's stupid. You're, you know, we don't do that to one another um, at all. One of the big words for us is, is honor. So you give feedback from a place of absolute honor and honesty. And that is where you say, this phrase has helped us tremendously. And this is some phraseology or languaging that I learned from um, my mentor's company and the people that work there. A, a powerful phrase is, my experience of you is. My experience of you is, which means, you're, I'm not saying you're always this way. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, my experience of you at this time is, this is what I'm picking up. My experience is, is that, that this doesn't seem to matter to you as much. My experience is that you seem to be very casual as it pertains to our marriage or um, the passion in our relationship. There's, there's a casualness to it and whatever. That's the kind of conversation that we have if it goes on. And it's not an attack. We share and give feedback. I was taught years ago that if you want to be a leader, lead your family, you must be open to feedback that Mr. Plummer's phrase was, uh, leaders eat feedback for breakfast. And, and that's powerful, meaning that I want it. I'm asking you, how do you think I could get better? I'll go talk, I just did a talk in, in uh, Florida right before we did the self um, shelter in place thing. And we were done, and my good friend Scott, I was sitting at, at lunch with him and his wife. I said, tell me how I can do better. Tell me how I can do better. I, I, I did a, a great job. They told me it was great. I said, how can I do better? What did you see? What tweaks can I make? I want to get better. I take this thing very serious. And so if I take my occupation serious, you can bet I'm going to take this serious. So a question I ask all the time is, how could I get better? What do you see? What do you need me to do? And that's feedback. And that's our not the communication so much style, because I don't even think that matters so much. I think you're come from the context of what you say is what's most important. And so if you remember the, the feedback word, circle it, underline it, ask for feedback. Somebody may not know how to give you an answer immediately. You could tell them, you don't have to tell me right now, but I'm making a request that you would give me some feedback on how I can do better at this. And then give them time to come back and, and tell you maybe later. And then when you get the feedback, don't, don't defend yourself. And don't, don't ever, let me tell you the most cowardly thing you can ever do, ever in your life. This is my lens. I don't have to be right about it. The most cowardly, vicious thing you can ever do would be to ask someone for feedback. And then they give it to you, right? And then later on, you turn it to, against them and go, well, you said that about me and you did whatever like, like a baby. And then that's going to shut down trust. That's going to shut down all of it because you're being manipulative. And one of the, when you play this victim role, you start manipulating people with emotion. Well, you said this and you did this and all that. And there's just no space for that in this. Mm -hmm. There's just not. We just don't do that. We're not going to do it, I hope. Um, you guys think she could beat me up, so I guess we're going to do whatever the heck she wants to do because <laughs> I'm just not going <laughs> to. But that's the rant. I'm done on that. So. Communication style, it's wrapped in two things, honesty, vulnerability, and honor. If I'm going to say it, I'm going to package it in a way that's going to be at least more of moving her forward than getting her stuck, taking her back to how it was back then, and ultimately trying to beat her down with my energy 
verbally, of course not physically, because I can't, obviously. obviously. Um, but in all seriousness, though, um, that's that's kind of how we operate on this thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That was the vulnerability that you just showed. I think we all appreciate that, you know, because that's what is going to make it work. And one thing that I know is the, the whole cliche thing of like the thing that's going to make any relationship or any business even or whatever work is communication. We've all heard that cliche of like communication is key, but we weren't really ever taught how to communicate, how to effectively communicate with one another. Yeah. So I think that that's where these kinds of conversations are very important. And not necessarily that it's a style, but it is a way of communicating, and it's an intentionality of communicating. There has to be an intentionality behind it. Right. And, and so here's a quite it's great. John Martin said, Mar Martinson said, uh -huh. 61 years of marriage. That's phenomenal. Yeah. One word that keeps wow. coming to mind is commitment. Mm -hmm. And John, it's absolutely true. And so how I was taught to think of commitment was we used the word intention. And so in that was you can be doing something and, and communicating, but the question is a little deeper, what am I committed to within this communication? So what's what am I really committed to? And as I'm talking to my spouse or to my children or my team, right, people that work with me, um, the, my coworkers, uh, whatever it is for any individual, as I'm speaking to them, what am I committed to in that? Am I committed to making them feel good, speaking condescendingly, tearing them down? Am I committed to making myself feel like I'm right and they're wrong, that I'm superior? Is there, what am I committed to in that? That's a really incredible, incredibly powerful question mm -hmm. to ask. Like even, it's not just what you're doing, it's how you do it. Holding hands is wonderful, most, many people don't. But it's like, what, what's behind the holding hands? Am I just holding hands? Am I just sitting here like, here you go, you ready? Like we're at some meeting at the, at the, at the movies and I've got my arm around her because I, other people know me and they're like, wanna watch how I am with my wife and I think, yeah, we gotta make this thing look like our marriage is amazing. I don't know what voice I'm using, but it's that guy. I like that voice. I like that I voice. I like that guy. And, <laughs> and, but am I doing that? Am I committed to making it out to how it looks to everybody else? Or am I really committed to saying what's really behind me in my behavior and even in my communication? What am I committed to? And so that's absolutely it. It is all commitment. It is. It's what we're committed to and what we're going to wrap what we're saying in, the commitment in that. And so that's, I think that's a huge, huge part of it. So honor, honesty, um, that's pretty, pretty much it. Yeah. So one thing when he and I were talking about... Go ahead. I'm, I'll point that yeah, out to you in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Um, one thing that he and I have had conversation, we had, and to like to be honest and vulnerable, we had like two Saturdays ago, I think, we had a long day of good, robust conversation <laughs> where we just had to keep talking until. And that was the thing that we came to was we're going to keep talking until we're going to keep working this out. And it wasn't arguing or whatever. It was we're going to just keep talking until, until we get this into a place where we're moving forward. So we had a long all day conversation basically. And that's one thing that we take very serious and we will do that continually. And that's just a part of being committed to moving forward. But one thing that we do not do, and this is something that we like hold a certain standard of not allowing mediocrity to seep in. Because if we don't have these conversations and if we don't stay committed to the intentionality of conversation with one another, date nights, you know, intimacy or whatever, like whatever that What'd is going to <laughs> whatever you know is going to take your marriage one step closer to being an extraordinary marriage. You know, like we just, we're not gonna allow mediocrity to set in. And going back to the very beginning of this is when we signed the papers and when we stood and, and exchanged our vows, we did not exchange vows to become roommates. We did not exchange vows to allow mediocrity to come in. And I keep saying that word. But anyway, we had this conversation two weeks ago and I landed on like, we're just gonna keep doing this until it moves forward. And I realized that if 
he notices something about me, say my, not inability, but my lack of speaking up when I need to speak up. If he notices it and he's aware that that's something that could be holding us back or driving a wedge into our marriage and he doesn't speak up, he is somehow Amen. allowing that, yeah, he's en enabling it and allowing the mediocrity to seep in little by little and it doesn't show up like overnight. He is allowing that himself. And then if he were to bring it to me and say, you know, this is something that I noticed, this is my experience of what's going on right now, and I were to get upset about it and become defensive about it, that's my way of allowing mediocrity to seep in. So it's, it's an exchange, and right. I think that that's something that's very important to recognize. And when something is brought up, and it is brought up with honor and respect, and you, and you like get defensive about it or yep. deny it or whatever, then that is slowly letting the mediocrity slip in. And we're not, we're not committed to mediocrity, period. Yeah, so um, it's the standard, right? So you set a standard for your marriage, mm -hmm. and there's a, one of, a mentor that I had. He's passed away now, but I read and studied a lot of his stuff. He used to say that your life will rise or fall in direct proportion or direct alignment to the standard that you choose to set. Mm -hmm. And so if I set a standard for myself um, as, as with my physical health, then I have to behave in accordance with that standard over time if I'm really gonna hold that standard. I set a standard in our marriage, she sets a standard in our marriage, and we, we've found what fits in that. And if we see that one another is not honoring that, what, what she's saying and, and what is so important is that you must be willing to have that conversation. Because if you don't, what happens is, somebody just put on here, if you play the victim, you can, you can become a victim to one another. You can become a victim to play in the character of victim. So imagine that it's a character you play. And if you step into being the victim, you can be a victim to your spouse, which is like, well, she doesn't operate from the standard we talked about, so I'm not going to either. So watch this. If she ain't going to do it, I'm not. That's not what this not what makes it work. I think what makes it work is where she says, this is the standard, I say this is the standard, and we hold each other to that standard. And if we're backing off of that, um, that's, where, that's where you let mediocrity come in and you can, it, maybe you can't change your spouse, but you can dang well create the space for your spouse to see the standard you're living for and create space for them to step up. And, and hopefully over time, and what we see is typically people will, if you're really intentional about creating that space and standing for it. And so we have a standard that, that we have set. And um, if not, let me just tell you, we're, we, our brain, think about it. When you say you like somebody, you're ultimately saying you like their brain. Your brain is always looking for shortcuts. And this is why marketers use that. So you walk down the cereal aisle in the grocery store and there's colors all over the boxes and Count Dracula or whoever, or Lucky from Lucky. What? Continue. <laughs> Lucky from Lucky Charms is looking you in the eye and the box is all colored and it looks so good because you don't really even know when you look at something new like that, you don't know what the contents are, but you go, wow, that's packaged really well, I'll take that. And you throw it into the the, the car and it's because marketers know that your brain is always looking for shortcuts and so in your marriage in your life with your physical health with all, whatever it is you can always be looking for shortcuts and that's not bad that's how we become innovative and, and creative we're looking for new ways to do things but in, in a marriage you must I believe be willing to set the standard and not do shortcuts because if, if you go victim to how somebody else acts today act like a victim because they didn't do it right and you take on that energy of well, and you put your head down, and you're wait, you're playing like a baby, waiting on them to come and rescue you and pull you out of this negative space that you're in. That is manipulation at its highest. It's like, well, I'm gonna pout and I'm gonna whine until she comes and gets me, until she comes and gets me, and she fixes me and makes everything better. I don't know what that was. I don't know. I don't know why I did that. And yes, it's Count Chocula. But I think you should do that voice the rest of that one. Well, okay, I'll do it. Well, if you want me to, I'll do it. You always make me do it. But that's oh that is being a victim to something or someone, and you absolutely lose all your power. Mm -hmm. 
When you go victim to something, it, it's a saying that I've shared so many times. When you even use the words have to, have to, when you say I have to be in my marriage, I have to go to work, I have to raise my kids, it's not true. You don't have to do anything, right? Everything. You are at choice in everything in your life. You are at choice 100% get it. You're at choice. You might say, well, uh, I'm not at choice to stay home right now. Yes, you are. You can go out in the streets and wander around and do whatever you want. Now, at some point, there may be consequences to it. Some kids say, well, I, don't, I have to go to school. No, you don't have to. If you don't go, there's probably going to be somebody that visits your front door and wants to haul you off to some you know, a school or, or something that, that they're going to control what you do. In a sense, though, there's your choice. And if you go victim to a person and you don't have the standard that you stand for, it becomes a way of manipulating, uh, trying to get people to behave a way you want them to. And sometimes we do that and it's not healthy. It's, it's a very toxic thing to go victim to your job, to, to life, to the president, to your community, to a pastor, a religious leader, somebody on the news. People are like, well, I hate the so-and-so and the mass media and all that stuff. Turn it off. Turn it off. You don't have to watch. Like, you know, I hate people, I hate the president, or I hate pop, turn it off. You don't have to watch it. Like, I'm not saying you don't need to be informed in some way, but you don't have to watch that. Like, you're going to go victim to somebody that's outside of your sphere? Like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do anything. So when you say have to, it's like you're relinquishing your power. And there's power in a marriage. There's power in a relationship to create better. And so um, I think that's, that's really important. I don't want to talk too long. I mean, I will talk all, all day. So what would you do when your spouse has friends that are toxic to them in the marriage and they just won't let them go? So um, <clears throat> that's a conversation of the experience you're creating and what you see and what you believe um, it, as it pertains to the overall marriage. So one of the most powerful things that I believe we can have are boundaries. Uh, boundaries, there's a book uh, Henry Cloud wrote called uh, Boundaries, and it, one of the things in there says boundaries are blessings, and they are. And if we set a standard for our marriage, we would say this is how we want to think, this is what's important to us, this is what we believe is a high value, then the people that we associate with and spend time with have to fit into that or else we're not going to spend time with them. And it's an old saying that if the experiences that you and I are having together are not about forward movement progress and, and good things of making an impact, then you and I no longer have experiences together. I can love you from a distance, but I'm not going to let you into my world, my inner circle, if you're bringing stuff that's toxic. I'm not going to. I know she's not going to. And all it would take would be the conversation of going, hey, I don't think you need to spend time with that person because I just, I just don't know that it doesn't feel like it's a, it's a, a great thing. And that's my experience. Now, I'm not telling you what to do. It's just my experience of it. And then you make adjustments. You know, I think healthy anything is about the willingness to make adjustments. And I just saw something the other day. It was like the Charles Darwin, the Darwinian principle is the strong survive. And I saw where someone was discussing that he didn't say the strong survive like physical. That wasn't his come from. His come from was that strong means that you're willing to adapt. And so it, it, it doesn't mean that she can't have friends and that I can't have friends and that every friend has to be like, let's go make a ton of money and let's go take on the world. Not saying that. I'm just saying that surely not going to be in my inner circle bringing toxic negative energy in. And you have to set those boundaries or at least say and share your experience and really why. And I think at some point as people develop some awareness of what they're really being committed to, and if I recognize that it bothers my spouse, then I'm going to have to say, well, what am I committed to? Am I committed to having a friendship that's going to hurt my spouse in some way and maybe mess our, our marriage? Because I'm not committed to that. I'm just not. I, what I'm committed to is, is us. That's what we said. That's what we agreed to. That's the standard. And so you probably might not change it with one conversation, but you can change it with hopefully a few conversations and loving encouragement. One of the things that I think you do many times, not you, we do, is one thing that we can do is when we see something we don't like and you push against it and you go, you shouldn't do that and you whatever, and it's the old saying of what you resist persists because you put energy into it. And I read a, an audio, listened to an audio book years ago by a guy named, his last name was Learman, and he said, what I focus on expands. And he said, so if I focus on it, it grows. If I focus on something I don't like with her, it grows and grows and grows, and now it's driving me crazy. 
And so what we do is we go, hey, this is something I don't necessarily like. We're going to have the conversation and kind of pull it up at the root and say, why is this? What's going on? And then make adjustments. And you don't always have to get your way, but at least you're honest with one another and at least you know why uh, or why a person may feel in the relationship like they feel. And that's the, the key, I think, the vulnerable part and the, the honest part. Um, anything else? It's good. Or, it is good. Yeah, so good. I just, um, one, one thing that I am encouraging myself on right now, and I hope this encourages someone to move forward and keep setting a standard for themselves and for their marriage and for their home relationships in general. But one thing that I have to, two things actually, First thing is I have to realize first that you are a human in and of itself. You are just a human. You are Ronnie Doss from Mount Airy, North Carolina. Before you knew me, there a pretty was... pretty amazing human, let's be honest. Very. Say it. <laughs> tell it. Tell the people. Let them know. Tell the people. Tell the people. Let them know. The people have spoken. <laughs> the people, the people. They voted that you're, you're stronger. Anyway, uh, I'm a human being. <laughs> yes, you are a human being just by yourself going through the human condition which we all are going through you're dealing with emotions that maybe you haven't felt before because like right now we're all feeling emotions we've probably not felt before yeah. in some form or fashion not just for right now but like you are going through the human condition just like i am and in our conversations we always have to keep that in mind that he is a human i'm a human we are having this experience together as separate humans, but doing it together and honoring that part of one another in communication. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then also the part of not allowing a not allowing the mediocrity to seep in and holding a certain standard. I have to always remember our kids are watching, and they see the standard that we're gonna set for us at ourselves. And like it's funny because we're like in. We're, we're, we're lovey like this. Like we love on each other in the kitchen and whatever. And Addison's like, ew, oh my God, oh, mom, y'all stop. You know, kids just, they, they do that voice grow. the whole time. Ew. <laughs> do that voice the whole time. Okay. Okay. Mom, stop. But <laughs> they, they see that. But, you know, she said something one day and I was like, well, here, here's the real deal, Addie. You know, would you rather see this from your mom and dad or would you like to see us not getting along? Or not communicating, or not loving on one another, you know. And she st and, and stopped that right in its tracks. See, you did kid, it right then, kid. Mom child. knows. Uh, but no, serious though. Like our kids are watching, and so is everybody else. It doesn't matter what you do; someone is going to be watching you. I'm, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I stay at home with our girls. I help him with business. Encourage him as uh, as a husband, and us being together. And it doesn't matter. Like somebody's watching, whether it's just the kids or. I'm watching myself. You know, somebody's watching and somebody's listening and picking up on the standard that you're holding for yourself and for your house and for your home and your marriage and your relationship, your communication. So if I, if we give ourselves permission to not hold a certain standard for our marriage, it's giving other people permission also. And that's not okay. Yeah. So Chris is good. Chris said, oh, hi, Mima. Mima said, I agree. See? Um, you are right. What would you say is a great approach to dealing with toxic repercussions from others for finally following through with establishing boundaries? Great question. Um, yeah. There's nothing you can do. Uh, you can do and set the boundary as clearly as you can with as much love and honor and respect for yourself and that person one of the phrases I learned, Chris, was don't make wrong. Make wrong. That's so When funny. I stand in front of a room and doing a training and there's 100 people in the room or 500 people in the room and I'm sharing some principle that I have learned that I didn't just dream up, like it's not like I had some epiphany, I didn't have a mountaintop experience, I didn't have all that, I just learned. But as I have learned and allowed myself to learn, if I stand in front of a room or a group of people and say, this is what you have to do or else, because this, I know I'm right, that's making people wrong that don't have the insight or the wisdom or the knowledge mm -hmm. or even the perspective, maybe just simply the perspective. Then you have to do with intelligence or, or wisdom. They just don't have the perspective that you do, so they might not understand it. So you, you share that without making wrong. But at the end of the day, you have to honor you. You are worth honoring of yourself because if you honor you and take care of you, 
The people that are meant to be in your life will get a better version of you than they would have if you tried to pacify everybody and make everybody happy. And that's what I think sometimes we do, and then we're exhausted. It's like we play the game of putting on all these masks for all these different people, trying to be somebody for them, and you wind up getting manipulated by their want, desire of you, and if it's toxic and you realize it's toxic, then that's a telltale sign yourself that this is probably a relationship that I don't need to have around me, that I don't need to have that allow proximity to me to, because what I do is too important, what we're about is too important, and I would rather have, it. neat saying, I'd rather leave the seat empty than fill it with someone that I have to compromise for. And if I'm not gonna compromise us, I'm just not so that I can say I have lots of friends. We think we got lots of friends on social media. We think we got lots of the acquaintances. I'm talking real friends. You may not, you may go through your life and not have more than a handful, maybe, of real friends that you know you can say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing, what I'm going on, and they're not going to take that to the street and destroy you with it. And that's hard to find, but if you're for people and honoring of people, you're going to have relationships over time like that. And I have that. I am so unbelievably grateful for my friend. I can list them, guys, that I know I could say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going on. This is the challenge I'm facing. And they're not going to go running off at the mouth going, hey, you know, Ronnie Doss is dealing with this. Like, you went, went gossiping and all that stuff. There's no room for that. So I'm grateful to have those. But those types of relationships are forged only when you're giving the best energy you can to them they're not forged by trying to please everybody because it's the old saying, if you're a friend to everybody, you're a friend to nobody. Meaning that you, you're trying to play for everybody. You got this mask on and it's just garbage. And that's, that's where you got to lay down the, the, the specific boundary and say, hey, look, uh, I think it's better that we would do it this way. This is my experience. And if they will not understand that and honor you in that and try to make some adjustments, then those people are not for you. That's, that's the end of the day. And you say, well, what if it's family? Well, it can be family. Just because you're born into a family doesn't mean that you owe your whole life to a person's emotional immaturity. You can't keep laying your life down because somebody else won't step up and say, hey, I need to read. I need to learn. I need to confront some of this old residue of being. You're going to lay your whole life down just because it's somebody that's called family? We're all family. We're all connected. We all come from the same place. And so um, be honoring of everybody. But don't forget to honor you, Chris. Like, make sure that you do for you because your, your spouse, your kids, your friends, they get a better version of you when you haven't depleted all your good energy trying to keep all these relationships with all these uh, people that maybe aren't taking themselves on as well. You're trying to keep all those healthy, and maybe they don't want to be healthy. Some people, I don't believe, want to get better. I don't believe some people, I think some people want to stay right where they're at because it, they don't have to deal with the pain of change and they just want to keep pulling people back into uh, their circle and the way they've been. And if you try to step out of it, they may point the finger at you and, and say that you're a bad person. And if that's the kind of person they are, do you really want that kind of person around you anyway? Pretty good look at it. Um, anything else? Um, one more question. We'll go, we'll do this. Um, and then, because we've been over an hour with you guys, so if you're still here, thank you. Um, but so Carl asks, what are ways to self-identify negative attributes about ourselves? Mm. Ask the wife. Like, I mean, feedback, right? Yeah. Like what you were talking about with feedback. So that's where you start there, right? Mm -hmm. And then what? What do you think? Well, if you get some feedback, uh, if it stings, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin that said, if it hurts, it instructs. So if it stings a little bit, it may be that that was some feedback that, that you needed. Uh, I can remember going and doing events when, uh, I, if, if Mr. Clemmer came and watched me do an event, he used to tell me, he's like, Ronnie, you could do a perfect event and I'm still gonna have feedback for you. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, How, what? How is that even possible? Why do you, why, you know, at first, because I was not used to having someone in my life that would say, you can still do better. You can do better. And, it, and it, I was okay with being pushed in that way by someone like him because I knew his heart. I knew that he cared for me. Sometimes I think we think love is, it's okay, you're good. Right. You know, you don't, you don't need to worry about anything. Don't take, don't take yourself you're on. Fine. It's you're fine. fine. It's good. You're, mm -hmm. It's all right. Yeah. No, that's not what I learned about love. Love was going, hey, you said this is what you wanted. 
You said you were going to go for it. Can I support you in that? And the way that I'm going to support you is to empower you, not enable you. And so uh, I had that, and he did that for me. And feedback now that he's no longer here um, in that role, I'm, I'm the guy now. It's my company. I'm, I'm the one that answers to me. And so I want to have people around me that I could ask. And that's why I said I did that in Florida. Can you tell me what I could do better? And be open to it. And if it stings, it probably is because it, 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 it scratches on something that's unresolved in you. It may be something that you haven't mastered yet, per se, and I'm not saying that you ever master everything, but if there's something that matters and there's an emotion that keeps coming up for you anytime somebody gives you some feedback, then you probably need to do a little work in that area. And the way you do the work is that you confront it and you're honest about it and say, hey, when you gave me the feedback, this is what I made it mean, this is what I experienced, this is what went on for me, and you know, I wanna talk a little more about that. And over time, that's what forges the relationship ahead and builds trust. You don't have trust with somebody if they won't be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking, let me say this, I didn't plan on doing this, listen, listen to me. Feedback is not a throwaway side comment. It is not where you go, well, you know you always do this. That is such garbage feedback. That is a That's not jab. communication. That is not, that's, that's not a jab, it's sarcasm. Sarcasm is garbage. Like if you won't say what needs to be said, then maybe you lack the courage, right? Because you're trying to say it without saying it. It's the passive aggressive BS stuff that people do so well of like, well, you know, you're always that way. Well, you just don't do this. It's such BS, I run from that, I despise it. I do, we both do. And um, feedback is gonna, it's gonna hurt sometimes. But if you take it and twist it around and try to manipulate people with it and act like, um, kind of like a baby and, and not take it on, you're probably not gonna grow at the rate that you could. And I don't think the relationships you have are gonna be as strong as they could be. Yeah, and, so, it's, and I mean, he, hear this really well. Like, it sucks and it's so hard to ask someone, but find some people that you really trust that are, like he said, the, the guys that are not gonna go like running off at the mouth when you wanna talk about something, but find people that you really trust, your wife, or some really close friends, a, a pastor, a mentor, or whoever, and go, I need you to tell me something that you think I could do better. Because we're just, a lot of times, completely blind to it, and it and it's gonna suck, and it's gonna hurt really bad, but find people that you can go, how can I be better in this friendship? How can I be better as an individual, or whatever, you know, and it's it's not it's not gonna be easy no, <laughs> at all, but. it's not. And if you say, well, I don't have any, think about this, I don't have any people like that I could talk to. Well, uh, maybe they're there and maybe you need to give it a shot and, and give it a try and see what comes of it if you try to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I could sit here and list out some friends of mine that over the years, you know, I've been doing the personal development thing for over a decade now, done trainings in, I think for participants in 11 countries, I've been to, I think, seven countries all over the United States. And I've picked up some great friends. I'm fortunate to know that I have those friends. But there are also guys that I know are for me, that love me, that care about me, because I also believe that they know that I love them and I care about them. And I'm also gonna call them on stuff if they're like kind of, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not taking it on like they said they were going to. And it doesn't mean that I'm the, I'm the drill sergeant friend. No, it's just more of like, do you wanna talk about it? Yeah, sure, okay, well then this is what we said we we're gonna do, let's take it on. And that's what I think fuels a trusting, empowered relationship. It really does, and um, if, if you don't have that, look around, there's probably some people there, and start forging ahead, and maybe if you don't have those relationships, maybe it's because you aren't standing for those qualities yourself. Like, if you're more bold and honest and vulnerable, then I think it creates space for other people to feel like they can do the same for you, and that's the old saying, what you see around you is really what's starting within you. My mentor, I had a great friend, Dan. Dan used to say, hey, what's coming to you is actually what's coming from you. Stephen Covey said that, that mm -hmm. what you have going on inside, your energy and the, the essence that you put off often provokes people to behave a certain way even if it's a behavior that you don't necessarily like. So you can always say, what is it about me that may be provoking this? And so if she's frustrated, if she's not talking, the first thing I'm gonna do is go, okay, yeah, do it. And so um, it just doesn't serve anybody. And so the feedback component is that you, you look within and say, what can, what can I do better? And practice that. Practice doesn't make perfect. 
practice makes better, right? And practicing your languaging is very important. We kind of have touched on this a little bit, but practicing the languaging of empowering, not enabling or belittling, that's one thing that bothers me so bad is when I see um, a spouse or a partner or somebody belittling the other or even your children. Um, that's, that is not communication at all, but finding a way to speak to someone so that it is honoring and moving that person forward is gonna make all the difference because they, they most, most likely, especially if they're not working on themselves per se, and you come to them and you say, this is, this is what you're doing and this is how you're making me feel. And that, that, that languaging most likely is just gonna bounce right off and they're, it's, not, it's not gonna be accepted and it's not gonna cause forward movement. So one thing that we've always stood on as a solid foundation is something called open, honest, responsible communication. And this is what something that we, hi Kennedy. Say hi. This is something that we um, learned from Mr. Clemmer is open, honest, responsible communication in that this is what went on. This is how I chose to feel. This is how I saw it happen. Now you tell me how you saw it happen. I'm telling you, this is my experience. I'm creating and taking responsibility not being the victim in the situation, but this is how I felt now to tell me how you felt. And then talk until, yeah. keep talking until. Yeah, if you don't share what your experience was and if you don't take ownership of the experience. Like when I say that my experience was, what I'm doing is I'm owning what I created. So it's not the circumstances per se, it's the, the, the experience I'm having. So circumstances may look a certain way, but what I have going on within me is that's on that's in a sense my own choosing so we go back to what we're really committed to in that and so um, that's for us kind of some groundwork there look Bart Walker said Kennedy that's Bart, Bart. it's birthday it's Bart. Bart say hi to Bart um, <laughs> last thing I think and we can be done with this um, your experience is yours alone an old book that I read many times. It was called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and there's some other ones that are similar. Yeah, Victor I just, Frankl read, I just went, read one called The Choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, Same. and the, so Victor weird. Frankl went through the Holocaust and dealt with all sorts of, of the things, that the atrocities there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he said in the book was, the last thing that can ever be taken from a human being is their own ability to choose right, their response, choose the experience they're creating in any given moment. This is someone who dealt with the atrocities of losing his family, seeing his friends starve to death, freeze to death, be tortured. Like, this is someone that saw that and said, the, one of the last things that can be taken away, they can take away all the physical stuff, but they can't take away your ability to choose. And you have in any moment the opportunity to choose. If somebody's rude to you, you get to choose how you respond because you get to choose what you make their rudeness mean. And so it's the old, what do they call it, the grocery store principle, like you're in line at the grocery store, the checkout person is rude to you. It's not because of you, it's maybe because of the person that went before you. And if you can remember that in life, it's like I'm the one creating my experience. So regardless of what the circumstances look like, I create my own experience and we can discuss that and in that there's almost like a smoothing off of the edges and if I get offended by what she says there's a saying that says if you get offended by every rub how would you ever expect to be polished and so if she gives me some feedback and I get upset like I don't want to hear that then I'm not going to be polished so to speak I don't think I'm going to be better and be able to bring something better to um, what we're doing mm -hmm. so that was a yeah. lot today I hope you guys um, I hope you guys got some stuff out of this, right? Yeah. Anything you want to add, last thing? Yes. Um, always feel free to send questions, even when we're not doing this, but email us, send us messages, and if we missed anybody, we're sorry, um, but we're so happy that you guys have been here with us. But we, um, we also, we talked about this last week, and we still want to make sure that you all know that we have a free program that we created to kind of help assist people with their minds and what we're all going through right now and staying kind of on the same page and still forward movement. And we have that um, on our website. It's ronniedoss.com forward slash boost. So we have uh, four videos in there so far and then we're gonna be uploading weekly videos just to kind of help keeping everybody on the same page moving forward. 
RonnieDoss.com forward slash boost, and we'll put this up here also in just a minute. Um, when you go into checkout on the checkout page, put in the promo code BOOST in all caps, B-O-O-S-T. And that makes it free. Yeah, and that'll make it free. Yeah, so and it, because it requires, does it require the credit card? It does, you have to, it does require Just for credit verification card. of identity, you put it in, but, but it's, it's free. free for it. This is a free gift. This is not a bait and switch. I'm not trying to go, now my thing, to the next thing to purchase, and we're not doing that. This no. was the response to this COVID-19 oh, <clears throat> COVID thing and people struggling and, and having to shelter in place. So we said, let's just create some videos to help people that are very relevant to this time yeah. just to stay encouraged. And so yeah. they're like four to five minute videos. We're putting one up each week, but you can watch that. But if you use promo code boost, it makes it absolutely free. And then the other thing, last thing, um, will you guys listen to the podcast? Uh, just hit the podcast button on your phone and type in Ronnie Doss in our Emerge podcast. It was like a Doss, but that podcast comes up and we're putting, I'm putting out and we've done some together. There are every few days they're going up and our downloads are, they're going up so much and it's so awesome and people are sharing those and we have people listening from all over the world. We're getting messages from people doing that and it's really cool. Um, and you can share those very easily when you're listening to it. If you have an iPhone, hit the up arrow. You can send the, the podcast out to people just like you can share this right now with people. Mm -hmm. You never know what somebody's experiencing or what they're feeling or whether they're hurting or they may be having a tough day and they may just cut on their phone or their, their laptop for a few minutes and if they watch something that can help them to shift their perspective in that moment, you don't have to solve the whole problem for people, but sometimes you're just helping them solve the next problem they have, which is where, where they're, they're focusing. And a friend of mine just said to me, he said, Ronnie, the, the biggest battle you ever fight is for your next thought. And so if you help someone to fight the battle for their next thought, sharing something like this, sharing a podcast, whatever that is, sometimes that's all people need to just keep putting one foot in front of the other to get out of this thing. And if you're, you know, keep walking in towards the, in the woods, at some point you keep walking long enough, you're now walking out of the woods. And I think what we do by sharing these things is to help one another to get out of the woods if we're feeling that. And I coach a lot of people. And when this first started happening, guys, when this all started going down, I went into panic mode for a minute. I didn't stay there long. I started thinking, where do we need to be? What do we need to do? What backups do we need to have? What resources do we need to have? When this rolled out like a month ago, I was like, do we need to go and be, I'm just telling you, back at home with my, my family, my, my dad's property, we got lots of land in North Carolina. Can we go there and stay there? Do we need to have that? Where do we need to be? And I went into this panic mode thing. And um, we working, I had no choice still but to coach people and work with the people that, that I get to help and their teams. And here's what I learned. When I can push people and help people to dig out of where they're at, I hear my own self speaking and encouraging and giving life to people, it changed my state. And so it's a reciprocal type of a thing when you're sharing information and talking to people. If you know it, if you learn it, teach it, right? If you get it, give it, right? That's the power of it. And when you do that over time, it not only is a huge healing thing and blessing to you, it winds up being something that people uh, benefit from also. And that's what it's about. It's, it's ultimately, it's a reciprocal win-win. And so um, share this. If this is, uh, my request is if this has helped you at all, would you please share it? If you listen to my podcast and you like it, would you share it? Um, that's the request. Um, I don't normally do that. I didn't think social media would be the thing that, that we would in a sense, use as often. It, it was a thing that we've used some, but um, with our video content and the platforms that we have and the insight we're sharing, uh, would you be willing to share that? And so if you'll share it, um, that can make a huge difference for other people. Uh, to us, it's, it, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's numbers. Numbers go up. Well, the numbers represent something. Um, they're, they're not everything, but they represent something. And so as we share things, we never know the impact we're gonna make for somebody else just with a word of insight or encouragement. You just never, ever know. And, and it's not selfish to say that this kind of thing needs to reach a mass number of people, like to help people move forward and keep their mind in check. Could you imagine if all of our world knew some of the concepts? Not that we know everything. That's, that's way too arrogant to say anything like that, but I could, know everything. <laughs> well, maybe you do, but I don't wanna. 
Anyway, did, I mean, it's w imagine a world that knew some of the things that we all know or that we're sharing here together to help us move forward as humanity. There's enough crap going on right now in the world being shared on social media that are, that are causing people to feel worse and worse and worse. And that like that's already happening anyway. But it's not selfish to say, you know what, share this and help, help somebody with something like this. If you know somebody struggling like in their marriage or relationships or whatever, or just, just need a little extra help or insight on something, this one was a little more marriage specific. But when we continue to do these, it's, it's about life. And could you imagine if the whole world knew things like this? And so, and, and maybe people know please things, share. guys. They yes. do, yeah. Maybe people know these things, they just don't or, know how. or maybe they just need to be reminded, or they hear one thing that helps. You know, Jim Rohn used to say you have a combination lock, and it's got four different numbers on it. Maybe you don't need all four numbers. Maybe a person just needs one number, one missing and they link. find the missing link, and they turn it, and they go, "Man, I've never thought of that before." And in that moment, this is why we go back to how we started today. It all starts with the mind. In that moment, you get one number, you turn it, everything starts to unlock, the new door opens, you step into a new season of your life with a new understanding, a new wisdom, and a, a different, uh, really, perspective and approach. And that can, that can change it for someone. And uh, last thing, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm hitting the end on this. You, you rip the world off when you aren't willing to share things and say things. You know, it's so bad, the terrorist kind of a thing, that terrorism came up. If you see something, say something. Well, that, that needs to work on the positive also. Mm -hmm. If you see something that works for you, say something to somebody else. You rip the world off when you aren't willing to encourage and speak because what is it, Wayne Dyer who passed away, Wayne Dyer used to say, wouldn't it be a shame if you went to your grave with your song still in you, yeah. meaning you didn't sing it, you didn't let it out, you didn't speak it. And if other people, by what you're learning from other people, are helping you to fine tune your song and to learn certain pitch and certain ways of delivering your song, like that would be a shame to not share it. And so whoever it is, there's, you're not gonna learn everything from one person. That's naive, but you can learn something from everyone, we all can. And that's why I think it's important for us to stay open and to be teachable. Uh, but then if there's something that's good, that we share it also. So um, with that being said, are we doing this again next yeah, Saturday? Yeah, do doing it. Again next Saturday? Yeah, and that's just the thing too, is just so that you know that that if, 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 there, if you have no one else, so many people are in their homes right now with no one around, we're going to be here. We're here always, and you have a community of people that we are hoping to build around these similar concepts but just so that you know that we are here for you and that we're doing this we're doing this just for the growth of humanity but we're here for you if you need us reach out yeah that's it thank you guys so much for being here today you guys are amazing thanks for um, engaging and questions and yeah. all that stuff it's really nice to be able to do this especially during a time when uh, we're supposed to you know be, be sheltering alone. in place and <laughs> kind of be to ourselves uh, this is really neat and we're very grateful and hopefully this has helped you in some way and that you pulled something good out of it. But you guys are phenomenal. We love you very much and uh, we're going to get out of this thing. We're going we're gonna to come through it and we're going to be better. And um, who knows, hopefully on the other side of it we have a better appreciation for relationships and for a community that is there, maybe things we've overlooked before. Uh, but uh, I believe we are going to be better. And so if anything you need from us, don't hesitate to reach out, messenger, uh, email, uh, whatever. But um, God bless you guys. I hope you have an awesome rest of the weekend and a great week next week. And, and we'll see you again. We'll do it same, again next same Saturday. Same time next Saturday. So, God bless you guys. We'll, we'll chat later. Thanks. Say bye. You say bye. No, bye. See you bye. guys. <laughs>